Well, hello everyone and welcome back to AJ 507 Ethics in Criminal Justice. My name is Tony Farrar and of course I am your instructor for this semester. So this week's lecture is going to cover chapter four where we're gonna take a look at becoming an ethical professional. And within that, we're gonna take, we're gonna kind of dive into some of those areas of influence on ethical decision making. So with that said, let's go ahead and just jump right in and start off with some of the learning objectives. So we're gonna take a look at some of those biological influences on behavior. Also, some of the psychological theories that attempt to explain differences in behavior. Why does one person behave this way and another person does not? And then we're also going to look again, as I said, at some of the spheres of influence on ethical decision making. And that would be um, individual or workplace or work group, organization, um, regulatory practices like laws and policies, and then finally culture. So a lot of information to cover. So let's go ahead and just kind of jump right in. So in this chapter, we're going to shift from the discussion of what is ethical to why some people act ethically and others unethically. So kind of, a, um, you know, makes you kind of wonder about why that is, right? And, you know, why people act in the way they do has really been the question for philosophers, religious scholars, psychologists, sociologists, psychiatrists, economists, and then more recently, criminologists. Because there is an obvious overlap between the criminologist question of why do people commit crime, because that's kind of the essence of criminology, if you will, and the one that we're asking right now, why do people commit unethical acts? What are some of the, the reasons for that? So we're going to kind of dive into that a little bit. And then, of course, we'll look at, and we've seen this uh, picture before, when we talk about ethics and morals and understand that they're a little bit different. Uh, when you look at ethics, this refers to the rules that a social system kind of provides us with. And then our morals are, those are our very own, our own principles. Okay, so a little bit of a different there, difference there. All right, so ethical decision-making can be influenced by external factors. And these factors play an important role in encouraging ethical behavior, um, you know, or facilitating unethical behavior. So an employee can be influenced by peers in a kind of a smaller group, right? So we call it a microclimate, but, you know, just a smaller work group or group of people. In ethical scandals, if you've you know, you followed some of these, you watch the news, or even if you know of some of these, it's often the case that the deviant behavior is really focused in or limited to kind of a smaller group or a unit versus an entire organization. And an employee can also be influenced by different things within the organization, things they call organizational factors. Um, reward structure, training, leadership, et cetera. And, and, and you have to really kind of kind of broaden your, your mind when you think about that, because let's look at it from a law enforcement perspective. What if you get more praise for more people you arrest? Could that influence you? So, and that's just one example to kind of look at. So an employee can be influenced by those organizational factors by reward structure, by certain training, whether it's up to date or good or not, and even leadership. Okay, so th these are all important things for us to uh, really kind of take note of. Now, finally, cultural and societal factors may influence the level of behavior one finds within any public service organization. And we're not just talking about law enforcement here, although that's our main focus, right? 
we're talking about, whether it's the courts, corrections, policing, it could be doctors, nurses, teachers, it could be corporate execs, okay, whatever that organization is, all right, um, some of the, the, the culture within that organization and even societal factors could influence the level of behavior that one finds with, you know, within that organization, specifically as we talk now within that public service organization. So now we kind of come to the question, why do some people lie and others tell the truth in similar situations? What makes that difference? Why do some people take advantage of others while others never would? And, and again, just kind of let this sink in as we start to get into the, the meat of the lecture, if you will. So we'll get back to these at the end of the lecture, but note that there are these areas or spheres of influence that we're going to call them on ethical decision making and those include individual the work group so it could be the unit the team etc organization the law and regulatory agencies and then finally culture and it kind of starts from the inside out so imagine like a target with, with different uh, colors, let's say, or even, you know, it's got the inner circle, uh, maybe even a dartboard. It's got the inner circle, then a circle outside that, then a circle outside that, then a circle outside that, then finally the outside circle. So the individual is at the very, you know, that's the bullseye. And then you have the outer circle around that, which would be the smaller group, peers, teams, units, then the, out, then the outer ring of that would be the organization. Then the outer ring of that would be the, the regulatory agencies and the law and the policy. And then finally, the outside ring would be culture. So that's a good kind of way to, to look at that. And these are different, you know, areas of influence. Okay, so when we're talking about, you know, you know individual influences, how does one develop from a infant if you will kind of an amoral infant to a virtual adult how does that path look and and and, and you know these these are interesting questions and, and realistically we can only skim the surface of the vast amounts of literature that is really out there um, that exists on this particular subject uh, but we are going to look at some of those um, things that kind of come about. And we'll talk about, again, again we're going to jump into biological and psychological research that helps us understand uh, moral development, which then turns into hopefully that ethical decision making. So there has been a, a long research tradition of exploring genetic influences on behavior. And if you're wondering uh, who those individuals are, well, those are my two daughters and it's several years ago, uh, but they're twins um, and they're not identical twins as you can tell, but you'll see kind of why I use their photo in here in, in a few minutes. And accumulated findings show identical twins are more similar than fraternal twins in the presence of things like schizophrenia, autism, dyslexia, learning disabilities, gambling addictions, and even criminality. And yes, these are my daughters again uh, when they were younger. And yeah, I was the dad that kind of dressed them the same. So, um, but they still turned out okay in spite of all of my efforts to uh, do, you know, make them look the same, etc. Anyway, okay, uh, enough of that. So, you know, genetics evidently and really does play a role in the presence of personality traits that may impact ethical decision making including whether someone is you know an introvert or an extrovert or neurotic or or a little bit more subtle or stable um you know kind of incurious or 
curious, open to new experiences, you know, ag agreeable or more antagonistic, um, or whether they're conscientious or, un you know, undirected. So we know that genetics plays a role, you know, in the presence of some of these personality traits. Um, and, and, and that's been proven kind of time and time again. Here's a couple of brains just to throw in there to kind of get you thinking about, you know, what's the difference? Why do we see two different views here? And, uh, you know, I'm not going to throw the answer out there. I'm just trying to get you to start to think uh, when you talk about genetics and different things like that, not everybody's the same, right? So that's kind of what we're talking about. Now, although his position was extremely controversial, Wilson in 1993 argued that values such as fairness, sympathy, self-control, and duty are moral senses and are a combination of genetics and socialization. And the reason I put this picture up here is that when you talk about socialization, okay, you can see here that there's a photo, kind of an x-ray, if you will, of a normal three-year-old child's brain versus a child the same age that has gone through extreme neglect. Okay, so you can see that there is a socialization aspect of that. So I just kind of wanted to show you some differences, as, again, as we start to kind of move through this. All right, and then Shermer in 2004 also argues that these traits are inherited, although he supports a group selection argument specifically you know, eons ago, humans that held these traits were more likely to survive than, you know, groups who did not. And Shermer states that asking why humans should be moral is like asking why we should be hungry or jealous. The answer is because we're, we are hardwired for some of these feelings and emotions through genetic selection. So again, that's kind of a, um, you know, an argument from Shermer. Okay, so, you know, again, we're still talking about biological factors. So accepting the evidence that there are some personality traits that seem to be partially influenced by inheritance, if you will, the question remains, well, what exactly then is being inherited? It could be that certain brain chemicals that have uh, shown to affect behavior differ among people, right? And the relative levels of these chemicals could be inherited, meaning it could pass from generation to generation, right? And there have been links between brain and predisposition to certain behaviors. Research focuses on hormones, including um, oxytocin, serotonin, and testosterone. And oxytocin is, is kind of what, what they call the moral molecule, if you will. And that's kind of, you know, related to nurturing and trusting and the pro-social attitude. And uh, serotonin is, um, you know, kind of the same thing. Uh, but then you have testosterone and you've got aggression, you know, anxiousness and suspicion. So, you know, just a couple of um, things to kind of think about. Um, and even uh, dopamine, you can kind of throw that in there as well, has been identified as related to nurturing, trusting, and the pro-social attitudes. Um, and then, you know, we talked about testosterone. We could put in a couple more, cortisol um, and, and even epinephrine um, have been associated with aggression, anxiousness, and suspicion. These are kind of the big three, if you will, uh, but there are others. And Paul Zak in 2012, a neuroeconomist, focuses on the importance of oxytocin, going so far as to call it the moral molecule. So he argues that this hormone promotes human bonding and trust. 
and, and and there are some other things that you can also take a look at in your in your textbook. We're not going to go into too uh, you know too deep here, um, but there, there's a little bit more on all of these um, different chemicals as well. Okay, so the neurotransmitter serotonin also seems to directly alter both moral judgment and behavior. And findings provided evidence that serotonin could promote prosocial behavior by enhancing harm aversion, thereby affecting the moral judgment um, and moral behavior. Um, and it, it's also been known to maybe stabilize um, stabilize your mood, etc. And then finally, uh, testosterone has a has long been identified as being associated with, uh, like I said, aggression, anxiousness, um, suspicion, etc. And, and and even a couple of other things that we could talk about. Um, and you know we know through research, etc. Uh, men have more testosterone than women typically. And over 70 studies examining sex differences in the brain functioning found that men are more likely to cheat, more antisocial, commit more serious crimes, and more often have serious childhood conduct dis disorders uh, than women. So ki kind of interesting, right? Um, also, uh, you find that men have, you know, more issues related to delinquency, school performance, hyperactivity, impulsivity, and even attention deficit disorders. So um, a, a lot of information just to kind of think about on the biological side. So then that kind of makes us ask the question, right? I mean, it, kind of what we talked about here when they do some of these comparisons. So are women more moral than men? And you know, I'm not really going to answer that. Um, I'm just going to kind of stay in the middle, but it is something for us to to kind of think about. So, in addition to brain chemistry, scientists have been studying the different parts of the brain and their relationship to moral judgment. Now, one study showed that the brain seemed to be hardwired, if you will, for moral judgment and in another study, it was determined that moral decision making was both rational and emotional. And typically when we talk about, um, you know, biological factors and things like that, we know that the frontal lobes of the brain seem to be implicated in not only reasoning, but also feelings of empathy, um, shame, and, and moral reasoning. And you can kind of look at the different parts right here as, as we kind of talk about an interesting case study for just one moment. So Phineas Gage was an American railroad construction foreman remembered for his improbable survival of an accident in which a large iron rod was driven completely through his head, destroying much of his brain's uh, left frontal lobe. And for, you know, for that injury's reported effects on his personality and behavior um, over the rain remaining 12 years of his life. So he had, you know, quite a few things. But, you know, one thing to kind of, uh, you know, learn from this is that he, you know, miraculously recovered but he changed from being a shy, soft-spoken, easygoing individual who, uh, to one who was kind of quick to anger, unpleasant, and even argumentative. So, you know, what they're saying here is that this physical injury to his brain changed his personality. Therefore, individuals with frontal lobe da damage, like Phineas Gage, sometimes display characteristics that may be related to unethical behavior, um, including um, increased impulsiveness or decreased attention spans, uh, possibly even having a tendency to be rude, unrestrained, maybe even called tactless um, in their behavior, and, and a tendency not to be able to 
follow instructions even after being able to verbalize uh, what they need to do. And in another study, just quickly, research compared those who had prefrontal lobe damage to those who had damage to other parts of the brain or no damage and found that when presented with a moral dilemma, those with prefrontal lobe damage had no difficulty applying utilitarian reasoning to moral judgments. However, they experienced no emotional aversion to harming individuals. So that's kind of a really interesting fact to think about. So just as we kind of continue through this and get, you know, get ready to shift gears here, note again that individuals with, you know, brain damage, especially that frontal lobe damage may display characteristics related to unethical behavior. And research does show moral decision making seems to take place in different parts of the brain. And again, you know, you talk about problem solving and a lot of things that fall underneath the frontal lobe area. So now we're going to um, take a look at what we call learning theories. Well, and actually before we hit learning theories, let me kind of throw one more thing in there. So just quickly, when we look at other fields of study, there is a parallel contrast in that some theories are based on the idea that humans make decisions rationally, right? While others focus on kind of that emotional response. So for instance, what they call rational choice theory of crime, they argue that criminals choose to commit crimes based on kind of a rational decision-making, meaning weighing the opportunities and the risks. So, you know, kind of, kind of an interesting thing, right? But it's called rational choice theory. And these theories view the individual as rationally, again, you know, weighing risk and reward. Now, other explanations of behavior point to emotional or relationship-based decision-making. And, and some theorists even mix the two approaches in that shame or guilt is one of a number of perceived risks that are correlated with not committing a crime. So, I mean, since arguably shame is an emotion based on relationships, this is an explanation that utilizes both rational and emotional motivations for behavior. Now, not trying to complicate it further, but to complicate it further, other researchers have also found that rational factors, like the risk of being caught, etc., are only, you know, kind of statistically significant in predicting crimes when moral norms are low. So there's a lot of stuff, right? I mean, and, and, and just a lot of things to kind of think about when we talk about this. Okay, so let's move on now to another theory. We already talked about biological uh, factors, etc. So let's talk about learning theory. So... Learning theorists believe that children learn what they are taught, including morals and values, as well as behavior. So, in other words, our beliefs about right and wrong behavior are shaped by rewards and punishments, especially during childhood. I mean, can you remember every, if you've had kids, okay, uh, do you ever remember saying, hey, uh, if you do this, I, I will get this for you. I will do this for you. I'll take you to McDonald's. I'll do this. Okay, I raised five kids, so I remember saying that. And I know that that kind of shaped my kids, whether it's right, wrong, or indifferent. So this is kind of what we're saying here. Now, this learning can take place through what we call modeling or reinforcement. Now note that criminology has also developed learning theory somewhat separately from what has um, you know occurred in psychology etc. But Sutherland, Burgess, and Akers um, you know and, and, and then Akers again uh, in a different paper have utilized learning theory 
to explain criminality. So, um, and do you think that kids learn from what they see, what they hear, what you say, all of those things? Well, that's really kind of true. All right, so let's talk now just using the premise that all human behavior is learned, therefore ethics is a function of learning rather than reasoning. And through the two things that we just talked about, modeling or reinforcement. So in modeling, values and moral beliefs come from, you know, those whom one admires and aspires to identify. So it's really no surprise that when, you know, asked who has been important in, you know, their moral development, most people start off by saying their parents because primary caregivers are the most significant people in life during the important formative years, typically, not with everybody, but typically. And although we may not hold the same views and have, this, have the same values, you know, as our parents, let's say, they are influential in our value formation, okay? So again, that's kind of the modeling aspect. Well, keeping the same premise, let's look at reinforcement. So another way learning takes place is through what we call reinforcement. And here behaviors and beliefs that are reinforced either through, you know, material reward or through more subjective rewards or praise, etc., are repeated and eventually become permanent. So you have to think about that now. Now, maybe this you're, you're thinking about it as a child, but do you think if there's a reward system in an organization that rewards people for certain things and that is a bad thing that they're getting rewarded for, that they will keep doing it? And I gave the example of, you know, writing tickets. Hey, whoever writes the most tickets is the winner. Here's the reward. You get this thing. Now, that doesn't happen. I can't say it's never happened, uh, but there's no such thing as a quota, just so you know. It doesn't mean it there never was early on in law enforcement, so I'm not saying that either, but I'm trying to give you a, at least a good, you know, understandable um, kind of comparison, if you will. If there was a reward for doing this and whatever this is is not good, people would still continue to do it. And that's one of the issues as it relates to, um, you know, reinforcement, et cetera. Now, Albert Bandura, born in uh, 1925, described how the successful use of rewards is related to a child's age. Now, as the child matures, concrete rewards and external sanctions are replaced by symbolic and internal control, such as one person's conscious. Now, eventually, uh, Bandura described the individual as not simply a passive recipient of rewards, but rather an active participant in the construction and meaning of rewards, right? Um, so again, feeding off of the reward system. Okay, so here are the two things that we just spoke of um, so you can look at the definition. All right, so modeling learning theory concept that people learn behaviors through values and attitudes through relationships. They identify with the person they want to be like. Reinforcement, behaviors and beliefs that are reinforced either through material rewards or subjective rewards like praise, etc. Okay, and then as we go a little bit further and we'll get, we're getting close to possibly taking our first break here. So we'll go back to Bandura's work. So Bandura's later work revolved around his development of the concept of what we call self-efficacy and moral identity. And self-efficacy can be defined as the individual's feelings of competence. And this sense is developed by comparing the self to others. And the idea of a moral identity is composed of moral agency, which involves intent, anticipation of consequences, and self-regulation, um, and moral efficacy, which is the belief that one can successfully decide 
to act in moral ways. So again, a lot of information and, and much research exists that evaluates the correlation between values and workplace behavior, although some of the findings are, are a little bit mixed. Now, uh, for instance, uh, Fritsch in 1995 found the, that value systems somewhat predicted types of wrongdoing in the workplace, right? And it could be like conflict of interest or bribery, bribery, etc. Uh, so for instance, he found that the values of wisdom and honesty were negatively related to lying and independence was positively related to whistleblowing. And, you know, the idea that different values affect different types of ethical behavior is an interesting finding and suggests the complexity of ethical decision making because it is, it is a little bit complex. I mean, it's not as simple as we tend to just see it. So we do have to understand that there are so many different things that are kind of, um, that make people do certain things. Okay, so this might be an okay time to take our first break. So we'll go ahead and stop here and then we'll, we'll come back and we'll jump right back into part two.